Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode two of the Fast Five with the DLT. You can see I got my flannel on and Brian's got his cold brew. Oh, yeah. uh, today, we're going to be looking at some bite-sized training and goals for your path to conquering Canvas and your Canvas courses. Um, again, I'm Chelsea Cody, and I'll let my co-host say hello as well. I just ripped my microphone out. Because why not? Why not? Um, I don't have fancy AirPods anymore. Um, I'm Brian, and we are half of our digital learning team, right? Uh, Angie and Martine are are also on the team. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Awesome. We're going to jump in with tip number one today. So I'm going to go ahead and start presenting my screen so those that are watching can see us walk through the steps. If you are listening, remember we will always include the resources and links that we have as show notes. Again. So our yeah. first tip today is going to be all about the Canvas Commons. Because if you listen to episode one, we talked a lot about joining like the elementary Facebook group and learning from what other experts are doing and expanding your PLN. So one way that you can look at what other people are doing in their courses is by accessing the Canvas Commons and um, importing some of their courses into your own. So on my computer, I just went to staff apps when I was logged in with my uh, Google account, my Garland ISD account. I went to staff apps and then to Canvas, just like we did on episode one. Um, and then I'm going to go down to the sandbox course that we created in our previous episode so that we can edit within this same course. So here I've got my fast five sandbox course. I'm going to click in. Right now it's unpublished. I didn't publish anything uh, when we were working on this last time. So it's still unpublished and we'll talk about publishing a little bit later. So what is the Canvas Commons? The Canvas Commons is a sharing point where teachers who are using Canvas can uh, put their courses so that you can access them and use them in your own course. So I'm here on my main course page. You can see I've got home. And then over on the right, I've got a bunch of different course listings, like import existing content, import from Commons, so on and so forth. For right now, I'm going to click on that import from Commons and it takes me to Canvas Commons. Okay, you can access Canvas Commons over on the left menu as well, but I really wanted to be able to model how to get it into your course as well as looking. I'm gonna go ahead and search for our amazing i3 at Hanley Elementary. Samantha Patton has been super active in the elementary um, Canvas Facebook group. So I'm gonna look at her courses. Hey, Brian, look at this. She has what? a couple of extra courses since yesterday when we were looking at this already. Dude, <laughs> uh, she's rocking it out. She is. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click on one of these courses um, to import, and then I'm going to go from there. So I'm going to click on her sample daily course. And then from here, I can see what this course would look like. It's giving me an outlay of what I would see. So. Um, there's a module for class information and then a module for what a daily schedule would look like. So she's got Monday, August 10th, Tuesday, August 11th, modeling that this would start for the next week. Smart. I could copy the resource link. So if Brian and I were both on a, a grade level team and we wanted to have ours look the same, and this is the one that we wanted to use, I could copy this resource link and send it to him so then he could import on his site as well. That would be super nice. Yeah, so then, you know, we could look the same, Brian. And, right. you know, because we almost so already do when you wear flannel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can add it to favorites. And then I'm going to click import slash download. Now, here's a great thing about importing slash download. If I'm on a computer, like my Mac, I could download it and then upload it. But it's a lot easier to just click the course I would like to use. So I'm going to choose my sandbox course. And I'm going to import it directly into this course. Hey, Chelsea. When I, yeah. I just wanted to recap for our listeners. So <laughs> basically, you already had a course created, your sandbox course, which is the huge important thing. You can't import a course unless so you, you have, have a course. course. <laughs> right. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you added that because yeah. if you try to go import this, it's going to ask you where you want to import it to. And if there's right. nothing to import it into, you're just looking at the comments, which yeah. is also fun. It's fun to see what yeah. other people have done. Um, on my screen now, it's saying you have successfully imported the course. 
Okay, it might take a while to see some of the changes. So I'm gonna actually go back to my Canvas course now. So I'm gonna go to my dashboard and I'm gonna go back into my sandbox to see if this course was imported. And indeed it was. Whoa. So now my homepage looks beautiful. I've got a little welcome. I've got my header. And then on each of these days, look at this beautiful calendar. Wow. Um, I'm assuming that it would you know, connect to something from here. So okay. is this like shared with Samantha too, or is it just your own course now? Like no one it's has access to It's just in my course. I am just wow. the per the teacher on this course and everything. Um, I can also see what is published or unpublished. So right now my course is unpublished. Yeah. Um, and it did change a couple of settings. So I see now it added a Seesaw link over here to the left, which mm -hmm. in Garland ISD, we're going to do this a little bit differently than just having um, the seesaw link here because there's actually two different links we'll go into this a lot yeah, more in depth in our next, next episode, episode. <laughs> um, but you can see it did change a couple of things i can also go to things like my pages and i can see that it you know it changed my front page here and it made this the welcome um and in one of our other tips brian's going to be talking about how to um actually set a new home page that's our next tip so We'll go through some of those steps here in just a second so you can see how Samantha actually did that on her course. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about that. So um, setting a new homepage, this is a great tip that I wanted to share because school's about to start. You know, in the timeline that we're in right now, school's about to start. Yeah, I don't know when you're watching this uh, or listening to this. It could be months in the future. Um, so setting a homepage could be a great way to like welcome students and you know also their parents when they join your class, especially if you're starting teaching uh, virtually. So um, I think the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is go to pages and you're gonna wanna start a new page. So see this course has like a lot of pages in there, which is great because she imported one uh, already. I wonder if there is like a welcome, there is a meet the teacher. So yes. And we did that in our last episode too. This yes. meet the teacher page. Yeah. Yeah. Throwback to our last episode. We did this. If you remember where we in, imported our gift there. So um, in order to set this as the homepage, we're going to actually have to publish this page first. So she clicked publish and it's green. If you're not watching this, it turns green. Um, so then you're going to click the three dots on the page and you're going to set it as the front page. Okay. So that is step, uh, step one and two. So publish the page that you want as your homepage, kind of like meet the teacher. Hey guys, what's going on? Step two is to set it as the front page. Then you want to go back to your main course page by clicking on home. Okay. And over on the right side of the page, you can choose the home page. And now that you've published that page, you're gonna choose the pages front page that you just set, okay? And when you click save, that is what students will see when they first log into your course. So again, I really like this option as a meet the teacher, you know, hey guys, this is what we're gonna be doing this year. And then maybe, you know, after like the second or third week of school, maybe you change the homepage back to modules you know, after you know everybody and they know who you are, you don't delete that page. You just come in here and you change the course homepage to start with your modules instead of your meet the teacher. So I think that's really uh, useful. And again, there are steps for this that we're going to be including in our show notes, but that, that would be my, my tip so far today. Yeah, and you saw when I pulled it in um, from the Canvas Commons, Samantha had already set another page as the mm -hmm. front page, she published it, and then um, it was that welcome page. So you really could have multiple pages that you've added and then you change over time in the modules, just like Brian was saying there. Yeah. Um, speaking of modules, Brian Dean, we're gonna go oh. ahead and jump in and add a module. Now, oh, when I go to the module tip? today, I know, da, 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 see how that just like oh. rolled on there? It's like oh. we planned it. <laughs> we did, it is like that. So I'm gonna click on modules again inside the sandbox course. And um, I can see I have some modules here now because I imported them from the commons. And all the little green check marks I'm seeing, that means that they're published. So if this is something I want students to be able to see and interact with, I want to be able to link to it, set it as my homepage, I would have these green check marks. 
If I don't want them to be published, I can unpublish by just clicking on that green check mark and unpublishing each of those. And I'm actually going to do that on my course now. Then I can go through and I can add a new module. A module really, uh, we want you to think of it as like a unit of study. This could be set up to be a week. So you see in the template I'm looking at, or if you're listening, it's set up as a weekly module. So this would be Monday, August 10th through Friday, August 14th, which happens to be our first week back to school. And for each day, there is a page. Now that page could be an activity. It could be something they're watching and engaging with, or it could be, you could add assignments where students are actually working in that assignment and turning something in because then it's connected to the grade book and there's um, other settings. We'll look at that in a second. Um, within your module, you could organize it as um, grouped by T. So maybe your um, curriculum units of study are something like, you know, today we're focusing on decimals and tomorrow we're focusing on fractions. I don't know why my mind went to math because I'm an English teacher. I should well, have like, stuck with something like compound sentences yeah. or um, essay writing, or maybe you're working on nonfiction. Uh, that felt a little foreign in my mouth trying yeah, to come up with the like terms. When I, like when I taught fifth grade, like um, the first <laughs> unit of fifth grade, I mean, this was, I'm going to date myself, y'all. But we, we talked about like prefixes and suffixes, suffixes. That's probably not the first unit now. But like that might be a module, right? And yes. then you're going to have, if you're self-contained in elementary, and you might have a, a, then a module for your uh, science and things like that. Or if you're a self-contained elementary teacher, like I like Chelsea's original um, kind of organization of week one. So then each, you might have a page for your math for the week uh, and then an assignment and then a page for your ELAR for the week, however you want to do it. But basically think of like a module as like organizing a unit of study or a time. Exactly right. And when I was talking about that publishing, unpublishing, you can really chunk materials for students by having things published or unpublished. I can work in here as a teacher on adding modules that the students won't see until I publish them. Um, I will give you a little tidbit. We'll be looking at student view here later. So this will come back up. Uh, I really recommend planning out what are students going to do? Are they going to be watching, looking? Or are they going to be interacting and submitting? Because that'll decide what you put on your module. So I'm going to go ahead and start a module here. The plus sign in Canvas is always going to you know, tell us, just like with all of our other synapses, it's add, we're gonna add something. So I'm gonna add a module and I'm gonna call this my um, sandbox practice module. For those of you listening, I typed everything correctly the first time. If you're watching, you, you can be amazed. Normally it takes me a little bit. So now this sandbox practice module comes at the bottom because I added it after I had the ones from the commons. I can choose to drop files here. They'll just automatically add where I can click the plus sign again to start adding things underneath my module. Okay, these would kind of be like files or activities within your one unit of study. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a, actually I'm gonna do an assignment since we looked at pages yeah. yesterday, Brian. So I'm gonna do a new that. assignment. And I don't know what I wanna call this. Fast five assignment numero uno, number one. Yeah, okay. like something that the kids would understand, you know, like if they're looking at it and they click on the assignments tab, it's clearly like, oh, this is the date, the assignment, you know, like that, like number one, number two, that's good. Yeah, and, and you can tell even just looking at this, and we'll look at the student view, if I had Monday, August 10th math, Monday, August 10th reading, Monday, August 10th mm -hmm. science, Monday, like you're going to start having a lot of materials right there on your, it's really important to keep the student what they're they're seeing as the user in mind when you're creating this yeah like i just think about a little kid if they had 10 different things mm. to do you know what i mean on like one day like that's a lot for that's too much for like a third grade you know what i mean it's a really important like she's saying to chunk that and see how how is this going to look for the kid exactly 
Well, I went into the assignment and so I did that just by clicking on the assignment name underneath the module and I'm going to click edit so that you can see it pulls up our RCE, which we learned in last episode stands for rich content editor, which looks very similar to anything we would see on a word processor, or Google doc. Um, we talked about some of the things you can do from here on the assignment. I can start putting in the things that I want them to be able to access or I want them to do. So I could still embed a YouTube video. I could say something like watch this video from YouTube and type your response to the question in three sentences, whatever I would like for those students. You can see that this is different from a page because down below I can assign points. So if this, you know, maybe I do a, a percentage of points. So each the, my weighting is based on points or maybe I want to actually do a percentage or complete or incomplete. And my favorite down here is even if I want something from the students, but I'm not gonna actually assign a grade to it, I can put it as not graded. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as 100 points. This is a big assignment. Um, there's a lot of details up here in the RCE. For those of you listening, there are no details in the RCE yet. Those of you watching, you can see that that was a joke, but I feel like uh, I should make sure that we understand the joke. Then I can decide on the submission type. Okay, are they gonna do this online? Is this something they're gonna do on paper? Maybe submit a picture, or are they gonna access something like a Google Doc, which we'll talk about soon as an internal external school or external tool, excuse me. Okay, and then I can decide who I'm gonna assign it to and when it's due. I'm gonna go ahead and click save and publish here. And I'm gonna go back to my modules so you can see what that looks like. So here's my assignment. I'm gonna publish this module as well. And that's really the basics of adding a module that was awesome it, and it's definitely i think this is like the biggest tip that we've given yet because how you organize the modules and how you organize the course i mean that's how it's going to look to the kids you know and to your students so um this is definitely something that you want to plan out um maybe even like before you start building i don't know I, I may i might do a google doc and like make like an outline i don't know but this is really good Really, really good. And sometimes I, I've heard the advice too, you know, and when we've been building, sometimes it's easier to build the pages and assignments and then build the module and oh. choose the assignments and the pages that go underneath. Okay. So there's also that option. You yeah. can build your module and then add to it. I like that. I like that. So you mentioned something in your, in your portion there that is actually my next tip, which was Google Drive integration. So Tip number four for today is Google Drive and Canvas. And I'm going to specifically, my tip is how to force a copy of a Google Doc template for, for students. So um, in your profile, you're going to need to authorize uh, the Google Drive tool. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and do that now. So you can click on settings. And there's going to be uh, web services. Okay, so you should see um, Google Drive. I know you're circling on Skype and Twitter, but I think we want to look at Google Drive. <laughs> yeah, I will say I'm circling on it because I did this step earlier. So normally yeah. your Google Drive would be under services. Yes. Okay. Other services. And then once you click on it and authorize, it'll come over to this registered service. This is really raw, guys. This is really raw. <laughs> uh, but yes. So Google Drive would be under other. You click on it, you sign in with your GISD, and then it's going to be under registered services. So that you have to do that first in order for this to work. All right. So let's go back to our um, sandbox course. And Chelsea, I kind of want to go back to that test module that you just made. Perfect. So I don't want to mess up any of the awesome stuff that we pulled in from uh, Samantha. So, all right, okay. so let's add an assignment with a Google Doc so that students get their own copy, okay? So let's add an assignment like you just did in your, in your tip. Um, when you select submission type on the assignment, uh, you're gonna wanna select external tool because the Google Drive integration is an external tool, right? It's not 
built into Canvas. It's um, an external product. So you click on that and then you search for the Google Drive or Google Cloud Assignments LTI. So when you click on that find, you see, you should see it right there. There's probably not that many other external tools that you have so far. And it, since you already authorized it, it should just pull up your drive and you should be able to see your folders and your files. And you can pick, maybe you made a template of a HyperDoc or a template of a uh, Google slide deck that you want your students to work in and turn into you, okay? So once you do that, you select that. And you might have to select it twice. I'm not really sure. It depends on what it asks you to do. Um, and then make sure that the assignment previously was set to anyone with the link can view, right? We're not going to jump to Google Drive and do that because we all probably know how to do that. But you want to make sure that what you're attaching has the right share settings because that will impact what the students see. And then that's it. So now you can see it right there in the rich content editor. And uh, when the students open it, when they click on the link, it'll be their own copy for them. So that is super useful. If you if you were a you know Google Classroom user, which most people were in our district at least, this is kind of familiar. Except in Google Classroom, you know, you were able to choose, you know, make a copy for each student right there. I mean, you can, it's just a little bit different on how it works here in Canvas. So I'll point out to you know when you were doing Google Classroom and you were assigning it, make a copy for each student. Right at the beginning of the document, it would put their name. Right, yeah. it would say Brian Dean, get to know you Google Doc. In this case, they would know that they're editing their copy because it it would still have the same name, but then they would see their Google mm -hmm. profile, even if it's just their two letters of their their name, their two initials, they'd see that little profile picture and then they'd be working. Yeah. And that brings us to our last tip, which is what does this look like for students? Mm -hmm. Okay, and Brian and That's I really so Yes, and we focused on this on our last couple of tips that it's really imperative to think about what it looks like on the student side of things. So now that I've published this assignment, I can actually view what this looks like for students. It's I would recommend, and I think it's imperative for us as educators, again, to be looking at what it looks like for students. So figure out what devices your students are on. If they're on a browser, look at things on a browser. If you have students that are on you know, a Chromebook, a laptop, accessing things on the browser, the Chrome browser. If you have kids that are also on an iPad or on a mobile device, do your best to see what it looks like on that mobile device, okay? See what it would look like on their side. So we're gonna talk about how you would do both of those things. In order to see what it looks like in student view, it has to be published. So I'm gonna go to my home and I'm gonna go ahead and, um, make sure that I have some of those modules published, which we did earlier, we had the green checks. And now I can click that student view. On the browser, I'll be able to see courses that are unpublished, but in order to see them on the app, which we'll talk about in a second, you'd have to publish the, the course. But remember, there's no students in here, so it's okay if you're publishing it, but it's not completed, you know, if you're wanting to look at it. So I've got my homepage, our beautiful homepage that we set earlier. And then I can also access my modules. And then I've got my two assignments here in modules, which in this fast five, we didn't put anything. So I'm not going to look at that, but we can look at our Google Doc practice. Now, something you'll notice here on the student app, I, it's asking me to authorize and sign in to see this because think about again, your students would be accessing this with their Google account. So you could practice this if you wanted. You could sign in with your Google account and see what this looks like. We're not going to worry about that. Um, I do want to show you again. I'm going to leave student view. To publish this course, I click publish right here. So it's unpublished. I'm going to publish it. And so this is now published. Now this is where I'm going to stop presenting because we're just going to talk about the student app. It's a little bit easier. Um, if you have a district iPad, the teacher app is already downloaded on your iPad. Okay, I can sign into the teacher app. It's got a yellow canvas logo. So that circle you dot, if you will, um, but it's yellow and it says teacher. 
Okay, I can access my courses, get notifications. Brian, I know you downloaded the teacher app yeah. on your mobile as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I downloaded um, both the just the Canvas teacher, Canvas student. I have the parent one. I can't really do much with that one. Obviously, I don't have a student right now that's using Canvas. But um, it's really cool because just like Google Classroom did, if you're, you know, busy, whatever, you're not sitting right at your computer, you can get a notification, like a push notification to your phone. Uh, I mean, it's going to work on Android, iPhone, uh, all, whatever you have that has apps. Uh, Canvas is really prolific, which is super nice. So, uh, But when I logged into like the student app, um, even as myself, I was able to see the courses that I taught. So that's that's a nice just quick way to look at it and see how it looks for the students. And I know too, for me, whenever I logged into the teacher app on my teacher iPad, my GISC iPad, um, when I went to go see the student view, there was like a, a banner, I think at the bottom, it said something similar to um, student view will open in the student app. And I really liked that because then I could see yeah. what does this look like on mobile? You know, kids right. aren't always going to be sitting like we are at our computer, talking to their computer, interacting mm -hmm. with a keyboard. Um, every kid has a different situation with their devices and being able to differentiate for those devices. Maybe you have a student that is usually on a Chromebook, but they're out on a lunch break with their parents and they're trying to access something from their parents' phone. Or maybe they're on a trip. Maybe they're really lucky and they got to go travel, but they're still keeping up with their courses. We want them to be able to access their education and the lessons we're providing from anywhere. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think also just uh, we use a lot of Google, right, in the district, which is awesome. So if you're doing kind of what we just modeled here and you're putting in like a Google Doc that you want the students to edit, you know, just knowing that, okay, that means they're going to also need the Google Docs app if they're on a mobile device, right? Now, if they're on a Chromebook, a laptop is not as much of an issue. It's just going to open another tab and they, you know, can work on the doc. But just kind of thinking through those processes of how it's going to look. So if and when a student contacts you with, hey, how do I do this? You're like, oh, okay, you're on mobile. So do you have XYZ to be able to do that? Um and, you know, I think just on a case by case basis, like know your students. And if there's a student who maybe is only working on a phone, maybe they can type their essay directly into their rich content editor. Right. So just thinking like that, um, not having to attach a template all the time because Canvas itself has some options for them to type and all that. But anyway, we're I think they, I think they get it. But just kind of keeping your students at the forefront of your mind and their experience in this course is so important. And we're going to be building on that experience as well, um, yeah. doing a focus, especially for our elementary crew, our pre-K through two, on um, Seesaw and then Canvas navigation for littles in our next episode. Yep. Some things that you can do there. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, thank you for joining us today. Uh, remember that you can follow us at Digital GISD on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, we're not on the book yet. Facebook, but Twitter <laughs> and Instagram for sure. Um, tune in next time. The next episode, episode three, is going to be all about Seesaw and Canvas. So it'll be kind of geared towards our primary teacher friends out there on how to kind of best integrate that, uh, both of those platforms. So thanks a lot. It was great. Yeah, we'll yeah. see you in the next episode. <laughs> yeah.